I want to say a big welcome to new JomoCast supporters, Allison Butler of Newfoundland, Canada, Tracy McDowell from Brooklyn, USA. Thank you so much for your support of the podcast. The JomoCast is 100% listener supported. Each episode takes about 40 hours to create and involves the work of our composer and producer, Tom. Hello. Social media lead, Rebecca. Hello. And me. We believe there are new and even more urgent questions to be asked now about digital well being, given that most of us will need to depend almost exclusively on digital channels for social support for the foreseeable future. On the podcast, we answer questions like How can I stop comparing online and trust that I am enough? How do I shift my attention from passively consuming online? to creatively connecting with neighbors and loved ones? How do I build the self-discipline to see things through? How do I stay on track doing the things I say I want to do without getting hijacked online? How do I make space for rest and play? How do I succeed in life without burning out? This podcast is made possible by you. Our listeners all over the world, from Brazil to Australia, the USA to Singapore. Please support the JomoCast for just $3 a month. Visit patreon.com forward slash JomoCast and sign up today. You will get Jomo swag and a handwritten note of thanks from me in the mail, a shout out on the podcast and a place on the Jomo wall of thanks for all of time. You'll also have the opportunity to ask future guests your questions. To sign up, go to patreon.com forward slash JomoCast. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash JomoCast. And thank you for supporting the content that supports you. My name is Christina Crook, and I am the author of The Joy of Missing Out. I want to welcome you to the JomoCast, a podcast for individuals who want to learn how to thrive in a digital age. Jomo is the joy of missing out on the right things, things like toxic hustle, comparison, and digital drain to make space for life-giving commitments to people and work that bring us peace, meaning, and joy. Here on the JomoCast, we are seeking answers to how we live well in a digital age. We believe there are new and even more urgent questions to be asked now about digital well-being, given that most of us are stuck online and will be for the foreseeable future because of COVID-19. Today, I'm speaking with David Heinemeyer Hansen, creator of the popular Ruby on Rails web development framework. Co-founder and CTO at Basecamp, a saner, organized way to manage projects and communicate company-wide, and a best-selling author of a number of books, which he's co-authored with his co-founder, Jason Freed. They've written It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work, Rework, which is also the name of Basecamp's podcast, and Remote, a book which includes all the arguments for why the time is right for remote work now and how to navigate the pitfalls, which has profound salience in our given moment. Welcome, David. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So you're married. You've got three kids at home right now, right? Quarantined like the rest of us. What does that look like? Yeah, it's it's a handful. Um, but in some ways, it's it's not that different for me uh, than probably is for a lot of other people because I was already working remotely from home before this whole thing started. So the main change for us is that we have a seven-year-old who used to go to first grade and he doesn't anymore. He's doing homeschooling. Um, But then we also have a four-year-old and a six-month-old who were already home and and sort of just playing. The the difference is there's no help. (laughs) Now it's just the five of us. and that has definitely taken some uh, adjustment. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, we're incredibly lucky. We're out here in Malibu. We have a little bit of green patch in front of our house we can go out on. Um, we were already set up for remote work. 
So my workday is not that different, except that perhaps there's a few more interruptions during the day. Um, so I'm, I, I shouldn't be complaining in any way, shape or form. My following questions were sort of what's changed and what hasn't changed. And given the nature of the way that you've structured base camp and remote work, I was curious to see how much it has has shifted. Uh, I think all parents right now, my husband and I, we've got three kids as well. And we've sort of made a pact or we have an understanding that we will just assume that someone will come in at some point during <laughs> any meeting we have just to have that base assumption um, kind of is a bit of a relief to Otherwise, it's it's almost impossible to uh, to control. It, it really is. And I think just accepting that that's not going to happen, that you're not going to be able to control your day in the same way as you used to is instructive. At Basecamp, most people work from home uh, remotely already, um, but there were a bunch of people who didn't. Uh, in Chicago, we had uh, or still have an office. It's empty right now. Not a ton of people were using it, but for the people who were, it's it's a real change. And then there were people and our people at Basecamp who worked remotely from home themselves. But all, all of a sudden, their spouse is home now, too. And maybe they don't have just spot for two home offices. So we've had that. We've had a bunch of video conferencing calls where, hey, the kids are running around in the background because someone had to sit at the kitchen counter or at the dining table to take that call. And I think it's simply... It's not simple. It, it, it's, it's complicated and it's difficult, but it becomes a lot less difficult, I think, if the whole company simply accepts that this is reality now. We don't have to hide. We don't have to pretend. This is just how we work now. And we're going to accept that we can't give 100% of work. The world is taking far too much of our attention and justifiably so. So there's less than 100% at, at work. And we have to tone down our ambitions. We have to tone down our expectations and say, we're going to get less done. That this is not the time to squeeze out maximum productivity if there ever was such a thing. And that's true even if you're set up to do it. As we talked about, like, my work situation is not that different. I was already working from home. It's true for a lot of people at Basecamp. But I can't put in 100%. Even if the my surroundings are still in a good place. There's simply just too much stuff going on. When this first kicked off for the first two weeks, I got nothing done. Nothing. I mean, I ran it on Twitter a lot and I, I obsessively reloaded um, all sorts of news sites and I completely overdosed on just all the information that was flowing in and out and trying to motivate people to do the right thing and, and start this work from home setup. But I didn't get anything done on any of the projects I was supposed to do. And at Basecamp, we took the sort of ultimate consequence in that regard, and we had a brand new product. We had already started promoting Hey.com, a new email service. We had lined it up for April, and we had started saying, oh, everyone, um, uh, get on the list. And we were going, and we were sort of sprinting, as you always are to some extent, towards the end of a crunch phase on a new project. And we just had to say, do you know what? This is not the right time. It's not the right time for our employees. It's not the right time for the market. It's not the right time in any way, shape, or form for us to push this out at sort of the height of a pandemic. So we just delayed it. And I think the key lesson there was that all deadlines are made up. And when the world changes, you can change your opinion too about what that deadline means or, or whether it even makes sense. And for us, the deadline we had for shipping a brand new product in April was just a bad idea. And we pushed it out and we didn't even set a new date on it right away. We just said, you know what, we're just going to take it easy for a bit. Uh, one of the first things we did just as, uh, as soon as this pandemic kicked off was we, we gave everyone essentially a four day weekend to get set. Like, hey, you're probably going to have to uh, buy some stuff to, to get hunkered down. You, you have to find a new rhythm and a new schedule for if you have kids or if you have a spouse or, or your surroundings. And let's get all that in place first. And then let's have another look at the work we have left and how we want to do it. It wasn't about stopping either, because at least for me, uh, having work, having something else than just watching the internet uh, bombard your mind all day long is, is actually a calming distraction. So we wanted to do that, but we wanted to accept that we needed um, 
smaller appetite for the work and and just say like all the plans we had um they're gonna have to wait so you already spoke about this a little bit but i want to talk about the decision to postpone hey you wrote you can't put in 100 percent at work when life asks for 150 percent something's got to give and that something for us had to be hey and it's not like life is daisies even if you don't have kids this is a really stressful time and it's our obligation at base camp to help everyone get through that the best we can launching a new product in the midst of that just wasn't the responsible thing to do so we won't Remember, as you already said, almost all deadlines are made up. You can change your mind when the world changes around you. So you're intentionally missing out on something with the hold on hay. And my question for you is, what does the joy of missing out mean to you? It's funny because I remember hearing the joy of missing out as a, as a term, um, maybe in 2015 or something like that. And I just, it was instantly one of those terms that just went, yes, this is now the label for something I felt for a long time. And I've really taken great pleasure in for a long time. So be able to, to label and name that pleasure makes it just all the easier to spot the places in your life where that's true. Um, I think in this case, maybe the word joy is, is an overstatement for what we feel about the, the missing out. But I think it's the same kind of dynamic that you look at all the stuff that's coming at you and then you choose some of it and say i'm not going to focus on that right now Mm -hmm. and for us saying we're not going to focus on the product right now we're going to be working far less than 100 percent. our main obligation is to serve the customers we already have with this product that we're already selling base camp which more relevant than ever a toolkit for remote work right so let's focus on that. And then we're sort of, we're shrinking our plate and there's just less that can fit on it. And I think, I mean, you should be shrinking your plate all the time, even when it's not a crisis. And I enjoy doing that a lot. But in this case, it was kind of forced upon us. I think though, um, the joy of missing out has, has been really interesting for the past month for me because normally, um, well, I shouldn't say normally, but for the past couple of years, I've been way more diligent about how I use technology. I am obsessively addicted to Twitter, for example. And I've tried to view the, that fire hose through the lens of missing out, the joy of missing out. And, and it's been probably the main inspiring factor for me to take breaks from Twitter. I occasionally just turn it off for a week. Um... And the joy, it's, it's funny. It's almost like uh, it's a delayed gratification. When I first go on a Twitter hiatus, for example, for just a week, the first day is so hard. Like there's constantly these impulses to pick up the phone and your thumb automatically reaches for, I think I have it on the, the third row is that icon for Twitter. And then I stop the thumb just above the icon and I don't click it and I just go like, wow. But then day two and day three, that's when you really experience the joy. Like the, the, you go through the withdrawal first and that's not necessarily always that uh, joyful. But then once you get out of the withdrawal, it's immensely satisfying. And I think for me, uh, most of that joy of missing out has been around technology because that is the main assault on the senses. And I need, uh, I need something else. I need a substitute. And what I tried for a long time was I tried to install sort of like better apps. I'd have Audible so I could listen to audiobooks. I'd have Kindle so I could read the book. It was too hard. I don't have the sort of discipline um, to not let the thumb go over on the other slide of the, of the icons and click on Twitter instead. So what I started doing uh, and what worked really well for me was paper. So paper books. Uh, it's funny because for the longest time, I just read all my books on Kindle. And I thought, why would you ever want a, a paper book ever again? This is so much more convenient. You got all the books in the world are available to you with just one click and you download them. And it's so it's so light. Um, and I think I went about probably 10 years like that, where I read uh, almost all books on that. Um, but then maybe two years ago, I started up picking up paper books again. And now I've been reading almost exclusively on paper books. And that joy, like the, the book doesn't do anything else. 
It has the pages that it was printed with whenever it was printed. There's no notifications. There's no temptations. There's no other apps in the book. I just opened the book and that's that, right? And I find to be that to be such a wonderful respite from from everywhere else where so much of the rest of the media we consume, it's certainly for me that I consume, I mean, whether it's reading news or it's, it's watching a video, it's all happening within this device that makes it almost impossible to miss out on all the things you want to miss out on because it's constantly calling you. So paper for me has really been the incarnation of that joy of missing out because I just I sit down with that book. I've just started reading um, Piketty's uh, latest um, Capital and Ideology, and it was it's a it's a book that encapsulates all these things I used to think were stupid about books. Like it's huge, just like a thousand pages, and you're like, this is just cumbersome and it's sort of annoying. Um, and now I feel the opposite. Like I actually like the weight of it, right? I like the fact that I can see how far into the book I I am in a way that just isn't possible in in the digital form. So, paper books. That is my uh, my real sort of bubble. Um, and, and it's also just such a conscious thing um, of, of, all right, now I'm dedicating my time to this, it, which is hard with a lot of other things, particularly if it involves technology. I love that you shared a couple of personal practices that you use, the breaks from Twitter, the change into paper books. I, how do you go about making the decisions with Twitter? I mean, you're, you're, you're quite infamous on Twitter. So are those breaks planned or do you kind of listen to sort of an inner nudge that you have around, OK, it's, it's time again to take a break? Yeah, I wish they were planned. I should plan them. I, I, I think maybe I'll try that this year to, to really uh, to plan them. But they really just come when when I just get to a place where I just go. Usually it's actually a reflection upon myself that if you spend enough time on Twitter, especially if you spend enough time arguing on Twitter, especially if you spend a a lot of time arguing on Twitter with strangers, you get to a place where I I think most people probably get to this place. You just get angry. And and I do. And I I like and I use some dose of anger, but it's like... um, it's like chili peppers, right? Like if you just douse the entire meal in chili peppers, it, you spoil the whole thing. If you have just a little, it's just the spice you need, right? I like that little bit of spice and it motivates me to write a lot of things that I think are important and engage with a lot of discussions that I think are, are important. But if it becomes all consuming, which unfortunately my experience is, it always does. It always becomes all consuming at some point. And then I just go like, this is not how I should be spending my life. Right. Because I I can see it in my usage where I'll have like a for me, a healthy usage that's I don't know, I I, maybe I'm on there for an hour a day. Right. And then it ramps up until all of a sudden I'll look at my phone, time spend or whatever. I've spent three hours. I'm like, what? I spent three hours arguing with strangers on Twitter. I'm not getting that time back. And even worse, it's not so much the time I spend in the activity. It's the state of mind it leaves me in afterwards. And I can, I notice it. I get just wound up in a way where, hey, the kids will do whatever the kids does, right? Or or kids do. And I'll get annoyed. And I'm like, why am I annoyed? This is a four-year-old. This is what they're supposed to do, right? I'm not annoyed because my four-year-old is doing something. I'm annoyed because I was in an annoyed state of mind. And I got there through arguing with strangers about, to some extent, stupid things on the internet, right? And that's just, it's not good. So whenever I get to that, it, it usually, I don't even get to that point. I get to that point, and then I spend another day going even further, and then I realize, yeah, no, I got to stop. So you're taking a break from Twitter, let's say, for a week. Does it help for you to focus on what you're going to do at that time instead? Yes, I need to have something else. Um, and for me, that's where the books come in. I read more than any other time, pretty much, when I'm on these Twitter breaks, right? Um, And they don't happen nearly often enough for me to be doing it right, because if I was doing it right, um, I'd be doing it far more. I always look back upon the time I spent on a Twitter break or on a Twitter low and see where I spend my time instead, and I'm almost always more satisfied with that time spent. If I think back of like, what did I learn from Twitter over the past month, right? Compared to the amount of time I spend on it, 
I'm often at a loss of picking out particular things. But ask me about any of the last five books I read or even books I read three years ago. And I can tell you a lot of things about how what that meant to me and what I learned and so on. So it, it's clearly not sort of a, um, a great medium for long lasting impressions, perhaps. But I also I don't want to be too negative about it either, because I also think they're they're great things and they're uncomfortable and they're they're spicy and they're contentious for all the reasons because the underlying debates are spicy and contentious. And that's perhaps if anything I have about the joy of missing out in in a broad sense that I think it can also be a license to retreat from the world in a way that if we all just retreated from the world all the time, how are we going to make the world better? How are we going to improve things? Um, it's the same sense I sometimes get with Stoicism, which is another sort of branch of life philosophy that I'm uh, that I'm big on. Is that like if we were all perfect Stoics all the time, um, would anything move forward? If we all just accepted whatever came our way and were content with our lot, um, I don't think that we would uh, we would be pushing. And we need to push, right? Especially when we don't need to. I look at my own life and where I've, I, I could do nothing, right? I, I, I don't have to engage in anything because it doesn't affect me personally in the, in the sense that like, hey, I'm already in the top 1% here, right? Like, so if I don't engage in any of these uh, debates directly, okay, I could retreat, but there are plenty of people who can't. And we have to distribute that space, that opportunity for the joy of missing out to more people. And sometimes that requires you individually not to be able to indulge in quite as much of the joy of missing out as you would otherwise have to. So I kind of swing back as a, uh, back and forth as a pendulum between these two things where like on one hand, oh no, I gotta, I gotta say something, I gotta engage, I gotta engage in these issues. And then the pendulum swings all the way over and I go like, you know what, I'm just gonna break myself if I keep doing this. And then it gotta swing back and then I gotta step away from it and and kind of do some self-care. And, and, and that self-care of, of missing out is, is just huge. And what I always find is, so I spend a, a week away. Usually when I take a break from Twitter, I also take a break from news somewhat. Um, or I'll read news once a day, right? And what I find is always, at the end of the week, am I less informed? No. I'm just as informed because like, there's just not, you don't need to follow the news every 15 minutes to know what's going on in the world, right? Um, when I'm on these breaks, one of the things I like the most is the New York Times evening briefing. It picks out, I think, like eight stories from the day. And it's just a paragraph of each. You can read the whole thing in like five minutes. And those five minutes will give you 95% as good coverage of like anything important that happened that day as spending four hours on, on Twitter going through all the minutia of it. It's true. And when I've taken a break, so my whole journey actually began with a 31 day fast from the Internet. And I found that the big stories, I mean, we're all isolated right now, but generally those big stories make their way into the local conversation at your local coffee shop or at your workplace or whatever it is. So you actually end up finding that news by way of someone else and actually creates a connection point for conversation. So I totally agree that uh, that whole conversation about how much news is good news? I think it's a really big question right now, given the situation we're in with COVID-19, because people are perpetually consuming, um, but a lot of it we can't action on. And that can feel, well, it is very paralyzing and ultimately depressing. And so having more local news actually is very empowering because if you hear of, you know, a local, well, all, all of us are trying to support local businesses right now. So if we know that local news and can take actionable steps to help that can be very empowering. So I love that you're mindful of the news consumption rate and uh, the New York Times. That's a great reminder because I haven't, uh, I need to resubscribe to that. I, with the New York Times was actually also one of the ways I got back into paper. So Jamie, my wife, always had these fond memories of getting the newspaper when, when she was growing. I think she even got the newspaper in her, in her 20s. I never did. I, I think we had a newspaper growing up. I never read it. Maybe about two years ago, we started a subscription on the paper edition uh, here at the house. And I was, it was like rediscovering this magic thing. You're like, oh, you're telling me like just once a day, someone will edit and compile a, a complete newspaper with sort of fresh stories and I can just read through it. Um, and what I found, w which was so different from the Twitter feed, was it was not curated by me just to tickle 
all my biases and and um, uh, assumptions because I have a curated feed. No, it was full of stories I wouldn't have read otherwise. It was full of stories I would sort of casually come across just by turning the page. Um, and I found that like this is one of those things we've lost a little bit as the internet has gotten so hyper focused on delivering your personal newspaper. You know what? I don't think that's a healthy idea at all. That idea that we should all get our own personally edited thing that just speaks exactly to what we're most likely to engage in as determined by some algorithm that's really out there just to juice engagement because that's good for for advertising or so on. And the newspaper is exactly the opposite, right? Like It's just the same thing for everyone. But it's just full of all sorts of things that speak to all sorts of, of different people. And that doesn't mean that the New York Times is sort of some special thing that's always right about it. everything. I think, in, in fact, you need the dose of a, an angry Twitter sometimes to to kind of counteract some of uh, some of the stuff that goes on in the New York Times in particular. But I just found it, it was just, it was just wonderful. And this, this idea that, that paper is, is a single focus app. And I mean, even saying that sounds so stupid, but um, that's how it feels like, right? When you're growing up in this, or when you're living in this environment of just always on media, that there's like this media that it's also done. That was the other thing I loved about getting a newspaper. I could keep turning pages until I got to the last page and then there were no more pages. It wouldn't just like refresh. <laughs> Amazing. I think this is a big ad for the New York Times. They're going to like that <laughs> a lot. Um, okay, you have three children. I am really curious about your approach to children's use with devices and what drives those standards for you and your wife. Yes, um, this is something I care very deeply about and where I have multiple conflicting values. Um, the first value I have is that as a guiding principle for all the parenting that I personally want to be involved with is that it's not about trying to, for me, to make my kids do what I want them to do. Um, that serves no purpose. So for me to tell them you can do this or you can't do that, it, it's a really poor tool. The only thing for me that matters is whether they grow into having their own limits and having their own guidance as how to do it. Now, there are life and death situations where like, I will grab them back if they're about to walk into traffic, right? But when it comes to other things like, do you want to eat so much ice cream that you puke? Go ahead. Actually, the, the best instruction, and <laughs> we've done this repeatedly, um, the best lesson for how much ice cream or candy you can be eat in a day is the, the tummy ache, right? Or, or, or outright puking, although we haven't had any of the kids outright puking. We've had plenty of tummy aches. Right. And where they go at the end of the day, oh, my, my stomach doesn't feel good. And it goes like, you know what? It's probably because you ate two bags of candy and I don't know, three servings of ice cream. And they go, yes. And it moderates itself. But that self-moderation, you can only trigger that by allowing kids to go over the limit. If you're constantly holding the line, if you're constantly holding the limit of what's too much, they never reach that point. They never learn it themselves. There are all these lessons that you cannot teach by words. They have to be taught by feelings, by experiences, by consequences. Um, I feel the same thing about like them doing, quote unquote, dangerous things that wouldn't kill them, right? Like climb them up on a rock where if you fall down, you hurt yourself, but you're not going to sort of crack your skull open. Um, you should do that and you should fall down. This is how you learn. This is the, the feedback loop um, where perhaps most controversially that comes up in discussions with other parents is around screen time. I don't believe in limits for screen time. I believe in compelling alternatives to screen time. And what I find is that our kids, uh, they're incredibly interested in playing games with us, in writing with us, in going walking outside. In, in fact, in most cases, I find that screen time is almost more for the parents than the, it is for the kids. It's the way to get the break. Right? When you're not interested in coming up with compelling alternatives and, and helping guide your kids through that, screen time is a wonderful reprieve from that. And do you know what? Sometimes that's just what you want. Sometimes I just want to sit down and, and read a book and, and not be engaged otherwise in play. Um, well, let them do screen time. And the other thing, too, I find so annoying with the whole debate is to center it around a word as broad and as vague as screen time. Screen time is the most useless concept of parenting I think we've endured in the past 10 years. Because what does that mean? Screen time is all sorts of different things. There's playing Minecraft. You know what? 
any of my kids have the license to play Minecraft for 14 hours a day if that's what they want to do. Minecraft is about the most wholesome, creatively invigorating game ever devised. And I am so pleased that that is the favorite game of, of both of my, my older boys because it's a great game. It's a great educational experience. It's a great social experience. My oldest plays Minecraft for at least two hours a day with his friends right now. They set up uh, an iPad next to the computer with FaceTime on, and there are three or four kids on it at the same time, building things, exploring things. I mean, I, I could scarcely come up with a more wholesome way for them to to spend their time. But even when it doesn't come to that, like perhaps what have pushed my um, kind of default biases the most have been YouTube. So I think YouTube as a general thing for kids is trash. I think in the sense that it can go down some very dark rabbit holes very quickly and you actually do need to be on that a little bit. Um, but at the same time, YouTube is not quite as broad as screen time, but it's pretty close. There is everything on YouTube. And one of the the things that, that both of my oldest have, have really enjoyed is to watch older kids play Minecraft. That this is a way they get to engage with older kids that... Like, hey, there aren't that many 12 or 14-year-olds right now that they can in, engage with. My kid goes to a, to school where, where that happens, but that doesn't happen right now. Uh, he does uh, remote learning and, and does a little bit with his own class, but not that much. So the way to learn from older kids uh, is to do this. And do you know what? It's fine. Uh, and what I also find, too, is, is as long as there's kind of like a garden of compelling alternatives, they'll know when they get enough. They binge just like we do, right? And uh, that's what really just gets me up on the barricades is that so many parents are so hypocritical when it comes to this. They're like, oh, kids, like 45 minutes of screen time a day and that's it, right? And at night, they'll they'll load up Netflix and they'll start on their favorite show and, and they won't go to bed until like 2 or 3 a.m. because they binge watch five episodes of, of TV in a row, right? Um, or they'll be on their phone or they'll do all these other things. And I think that's the other thing is as these things go at this level of consumption, um, unless you're willing to fully put down and and be the example you want to be, you just come off as a hypocrite. And I think kids are incredibly sort of good at sniffing that out. For sure. So I just, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the authoritarian figure. Uh, obedience is, is, not a, is not a positive word. I, I think the idea that kids evaluate for themselves what is good and what is not good for them even when you disagree that's what we want right like you want at the end for someone to have the internal mechanisms for deciding what's good not just they're not just doing it because like some rules are telling them to do it or so forth so this this whole sense of of authority and and what role or or, or how much authority you should have in your kid's life is is something I'm probably pretty extreme on. I, I don't always agree with uh, my wife and I don't always agree on it, but we're, we're sort of pretty close. Um, uh, the contention usually comes in around sometimes screen times. If, if they, I mean, we've had days where literally the kids have been on screens for like eight hours. And, you know, I'm, I can't get riled up about that. I've, I'm probably on screens for 14 hours. So, I mean, for them to spend eight hours on, and then the thing is, is, is that the, it kind of flips back, right? And then, they get interested in uh, once they OD on it, and they eventually do. Uh, one of the uh, most instructive uh, examples of this was when my oldest was, I think, like four or five. He got onto this uh, YouTube channel called Tory Ryan, which is this kid that reviews toys. And it, it's for adults, it, it's a really annoying show. It really is. I, I had a very hard time. It tested my inclinations of how much to allow the kid to, to do things under that. And, and my wife was like, I think this is a bad show. And I was like, I agree. I don't think this is a great show. I'll tell you what, if we just let him binge it out for a week, he's going to be cured. She's like, I don't think so. I don't think so. And, and he would binge it out and he would binge it out. It took, maybe it took two weeks. He's never watched Tori Ryan again, right? Like it just got to the point where you fill up and, and then you move on. Versus if you keep it this forbidden fruit, oh, you can't have this. Why? Because I, I say you can't. I've seen this over and over again. Whenever there's been anything about like a, a game that's perhaps rated for 13 year olds and my seven year old, like, oh, can I play? Can I play? Can I play? The, the, the way to keep it as the focus of his attention is just to say, no, you can't. Can't play it. You can't do anything. And of course, there are cases where, where you should, but there are far fewer than you would, 
naturally be inclined to believe. Uh, far more of it is just let them have a go at it. They're going to get over it. And, and, and if they don't get over it, maybe you miss something. That's how I felt about YouTube. Um, I was pretty negative and, and we uninstalled YouTube and so on from, from the kids' iPad early on. And then somehow they got on to watching one of these shows where one of the older kids plays uh, Minecraft. And at first I was like, I don't like this. Uh, this is YouTube. And, and I had that same thing of a, almost like this is screen time, right? YouTube is just universally bad and therefore they shouldn't be doing it. And, and they kept on watching it and, and I came around on it. Like I watched the evolution of, of both of the kids, both in terms of the complexity of the builds that they did. Of course they would get better at Minecraft when they watch someone who's four or five years older than them play the game. They learn more advanced things. They open up more avenues into it. And then I think back on when I was growing up, I loved hanging out with older kids. It was like an accelerating learning thing. You have a bunch of seven-year-olds hanging out. All right, they can teach each other a little bit of stuff. But you you throw in a 10-year-old, you throw in a 12-year-old, all of a sudden, boom, like there's no speed limits anymore. They can learn a bunch of stuff really quickly. And I thought like, yeah, I was I was wrong on that. And, and I'm grateful that they've done that, even if I at times find it annoying, right? Like you listen to these YouTubers and like there's sort of a style to it. And, and it's not the style that I enjoy <laughs> watching or listening to, but um, all good be with that. There's something around, you kind of referred to it a couple of times, but putting in the work um, as a parent to actually participate with the content, to actually understand what's in there, where it's way easier to just sort of like, you know, wave the magic wand and let them be and let them do what they want to do. I think there's some sort of balance, at least from my perspective, around engaging enough with the content where you see that there is value in something that you would have, like you you described with YouTube, just like wash your hands of it. I definitely need to do more of that. My husband tends to be the one that sits and watches the horrible thing with the horrible voice and gets through all of that to be like, okay, what is the storyline here? What are the values, you know, kind of unearthing it a little bit. And I think our children definitely um, benefit greatly from that. Um, The whole thing of just letting them binge it out is not something that I've heard very often, but as a parent of also three children, I can see how that could be a really powerful strategy because it's Easter weekend and our kids came into giant chocolate eggs that are the size of like their body, basically, like some wonderful community organization brought them around. And they're not really knocking out that much of that chocolate because they're like, they ate it and eat it until they're like, okay, well, now I'm done with this and move on. Um, So to say that and to use the term screen time, I don't know if we have a better term than screen time. I'd be curious to hear if you have a different term that you like to use, but it makes sense to me that that strategy would also work for that. Yeah, I think the thing is that most kids, well, I shouldn't say most kids. I have three. So three examples here, and and one of them is even too small to uh, extract any lessons from on on this level. The two kids that we've had, um, the trust that I place in them, they're pretty good at returning that. And they're also pretty good at the opposite. When they smell that there's not trust, um, that's when usually we get into the most conflict. When they smell that like, this is an arbitrary limit. You don't actually have good authority to put it down. Why is it here? That's when we get into to the conflict a lot of the times. And sometimes you do also get into the conflict, especially four-year-old. Um, screens are compelling because they're, they're interesting. And, and sometimes we're like, hey, let's go out for a, a, a walk, right? And the four-year-old, no, I, I want to keep playing my game, right? One way of doing it is, is you could just say like, well, that's it. I'm taking your iPad, like it's over and then forcing the kid out. Like, what are they going to learn from that? Just that they don't have any agency in it, that someone else controls what they like and what they don't like. What we found is like, okay, you can do that. We're going outside, right? And we'll just go outside. And nine out of 10 times, if not 10 out of 10 times, he'll come in two minutes, right? And it's the same thing at at, at bedtime. We, we try to sort of, go to bed around 8.30 or something at our house. And very often, especially the, the four-year-old will just go like, I'm not ready for bed. And you could have a big fight about it. The fight is probably going to last 30, 40 minutes. Or you could simply go, okay, we're going upstairs. I'm turning off the lights. You can come up when you're ready. Sometimes kid comes up in five minutes. Sometimes comes up in 15 minutes. Either of those intervals is way shorter than a huge fight where you're trying to force someone to go to sleep. Because that's the thing about kids too. Really are 
quite substantial limits of what you can make another person do. Even if it's a very small person, you can't make them eat food they don't want to eat. You can't make them go to sleep. That's just not a thing. Like they will not, You can make them go into their room and perhaps you can put them in their bed. You can't force them to go to sleep. So just getting out of that notion that that's what you should even try to do, um, I think it's helpful. And the other thing is, is to look at the long picture. Like it's one thing if, okay, for three weeks straight, the only thing that you lived off was chocolate and YouTube, right? You know what? That's generally not, that's an overstated danger that that's going to happen. Most of the time, it's like the one day, right? The one day you either binge out on chocolate or you binge out on YouTube. It's fine. It's, in fact, it's good. You, you should hit, as, as I said, you should hit the limits and you should find them yourself and then you will portion control from there. And this is particularly uh, instructive to seeing our oldest. Um, our oldest used to be crazy about candy. And he just got to a point where, like, I just didn't say no. Oh, you want candy? Okay. You, you have candy. And he kept eating candy. It's, it's, not, it's not magical anymore. It's not this um, uh, uh, limited resource that, like, is being doled out in these tiny little pockets. So it just lost interest. The other thing to do to avoid all those conflicts is don't have the things you don't want. Don't stock your fridge full of stuff that you are then the arbiter of doling out in, in small portions while the kid can see, wait, all the stuff is there. Why aren't you letting me have it? So when it comes to food and, and getting kids to, to eat something healthy, just try to have the healthy stuff. Doesn't mean that you should never not have, have the other stuff. I mean, right now they just got a bunch of candy and, and they ate that and it's fine. And then it'll go back to the thing that's in the fridge is yogurt, right? Guess that's what I'm having. Yeah. Okay. I want to switch gears a little bit here and talk a little bit about um, an interview I listened to of yours, I believe it was on the Rework podcast about Marie Kondo's philosophy. So the KonMari philosophy in terms of as it pertains to, you know, tidying up our physical spaces. I'm curious to hear your thoughts and how you think we can use the same methodology with our digital tools. Yes. So this idea of evaluating the things in your life and asking if they bring joy um, was really Again, one of the things that, that labeled something I was already trying to do um, and gave it a specific focus. I came about this by moving. So over the past 10 years or so, um, more so a few years back, we moved a lot. And the first time we moved, we packed up so much stuff. And we had like multiple suitcases. And then we went to where we were going to live. And we realized like we didn't need any of that stuff. The next time we moved, um, I basically had like one suitcase and a backpack, right? Like, and I just, I came to realize that first of all, uh, most of the stuff that I had, um, not only wasn't I using it, but I felt better when I didn't have it. And I also get the critiques of all this, that this is a privileged position. If you're in a position to rebuy anything at any time, it's much easier not to sort of have a bunch of stuff. And I fully accept all of those things. But for me, in my life circumstances, I felt better when I had fewer things. It's funny, I posted a, uh, a picture of my desk um, on a blog post, um, or actually Jason posted a picture of, of all of our desks at Basecamp on a blog post a, a while back. And the picture I posted of my desk was, it, it looked like, as someone put it in the common thread, like no one does any work there. Because it was so messy or there was nothing there? No, nope, because there was nothing there. Okay. <laughs> there was nothing. And, and I think it's, it's a good point because a, a lot of people that seem to fall in one or two camps, right? Like for me... If my desk is full of stuff, I, I can't get any work done. I must clean up all of my surroundings before I feel like I'm in a space where I, I can do stuff. Um, and for other people, they're like, well, how can you be creative if you don't have these piles of papers and all these other things you need access to? Yeah, for, for me, that's not that. And I try to do things, the same thing on the, on the digital side of things. So that's about a, a bunch of these inboxes we have in our lives. There's the literal inbox um, for, for email. And for a long time, I was addicted to Inbox Zero. And Inbox Zero is this methodology where you should essentially never let anything linger in your inbox and you should clear everything out right away. And that's how you get through email. And, and that's great. And to some extent, I, I buy that, but it got me on a bad treadmill where all of a sudden any incoming email, regardless of who it was from, regardless of what it was about, became the most important thing I could be dealing with because I wanted to get back to Inbox Zero. That's not a healthy treadmill at all, especially how the majority of email clients today are built, where anyone who just have your email address, they can get your attention when they choose to. Terrible model, right? So 
This is one of those problems we, we've been working hard at with Hey.com, a, a email client that I've tried to build for my way of, of processing. I want to be on Inbox Zero, but about the important things. I don't want to just be slavishly tied to this idea that I have to keep the folder empty regardless of what's being put inside it. But for the folder I determined to be important, I do want to keep it empty. So actually just yesterday, I just cleaned up my download folder. I just, any of these folders that like have big buckets of stuff, they feel like weight. Whether they're physical or whether they're uh, digital, for me, it feels like weight. And I do best when it's empty. Like empty desk, empty download folder, empty inbox. It's almost like for me, and, and this is why I like the Marie Kondo approach so much, because she spoke to exactly that. That sense for me that I can't really find rest and I can't get work done until all the other stuff is gone, until all the cleanup is done, really resonated with me. Um, so I try to follow that. And, and I don't have any, at any one time, my desktop on my computer has probably like three files. And they're just the ones I'm dealing with right now. I don't leave and linger a bunch of stuff around. Um, as I say, I try to clean up any of these other inboxes that I have. And I find that I have the easiest way to go into the work I really want to do to get into the flow state once that's all taken care of. In terms of onboarding new hardware or software, do you go through this thought process about whether that's something that you want to take into the future with you, whether that's something that's actually going to bring joy into your life, or do you try things out and then sort of discern? Yeah, that's that's a great point. Because um, so on the one hand, I, I like to have this, these few things. On the other hand, I'm very curious about technology. So I, I have a tendency to kind of want to get the latest thing. The way I try to square it is, is I also get rid of a lot of things and I get rid of them very quickly. So I, I like to try things, but then not sort of just, okay, I try it and, and then I just leave it hanging around. No, I'd rather just try things and then quickly decide, is that something that's going to be in my life or is it not? And if it's not, it's got to go. So apps, any kind of like actual physical device, those kinds of things? Apps, I think is, 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 um, is a good, I think I've had a pretty stable uh, home screen for like five years. I don't know if, if actually, let me look. Um, I don't think that beyond sort of some of the new stuff that we've been working on, like, hey, got a icon on my, um, but that basically just replaced the other email client that I was. Otherwise, I've had essentially the same home screen for, for five years. Um, I have a tendency to really deeply like very few things. And when I find something I really like, it's almost like that is done. So something else. So I'm a programmer. And for a lot of programmers, they love just learning programming languages for the sake of it. I like learning programming languages on Till I found Ruby, which is the programming language that I use. And then I was like, this is it. I'm done. I'm good. I did the same thing with, um, with cameras. So I, I used to have a lot of different kinds of cameras. And now I found that um, a Leica M10 with a 50 millimeter lens, that's the camera I take great pictures with. It, it suits the kind of photography that I do, which is all family photography. So that's just, I got rid of everything else. Now I just have the one camera um, and I have the one programming language. And I try to sort of get to these things where I'm intensely focused on on finding the thing I really like. And then when I'm done, all right, let's 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 close that down and we can move on to something else. And then I can try to find the perfect, I don't know, watch or, or something else and then get rid of all the, the other stuff. So I am constantly on the search, but I try to be on the search in kind of in, in new domains. Um, if that makes any sense. That does make sense. And there's this whole thing, you know, of decision making fatigue, which is what we're experiencing constantly online. And so the fact that you've already found your most beloved coding language or most beloved camera means that this that decisions, well, at least what I hear you saying is that that decisions already been made for you. Yes. So you don't need to engage in that decision making process anymore. And it just creates so much space to to think about new things that you can like, you can open something up, and you can dive really deep into it, which is what I do. So w when I was still going through cameras, like I would learn everything, everything about all the models and I, all of it, right? And I would try a bunch of stuff. And then we get to the point, okay, now I've reached the thing that I like. Let's close the box. Now I can make room for something else. And I often talk to people when, when you look at, um, oh, so you do photography, you do programming, you, you do writing, or, or you do speaking, or, or, um, or any of these other things. It's like, how do you manage to do all of it at the same time? I'm like, I don't. I don't do all of it at the same time. I, I live very sequentially. Um, not exclusively so, but a lot of times I work 40 hours or less per week. 
Um, so, so that's that box, and that takes up so much time. There's room for like one or two hobbies outside of that, right? I can't have all of them on the plate at the same time. When I was learning how to drive a race car, that was the main hobby, and that's what I spend my weekends on. And then I got to a point where I didn't need to spend every weekend on it, and, and I was good enough to do the things that I wanted to do with race cars, and I moved on to something else. Then I did photography, and that was just a, a huge focus. Now, um, both of those things have gotten to a place where I can do what I've learned enough to not be on that like really intense on ramp, um, now I can spend my time like reading some books instead, and like have that be it. Um, so living sequentially in that way, and then just realizing, hey, I'm I'm forty. Like that's how I ended up doing a bunch of stuff. I, I did some of it for two years, and then I did something else of it for five years, and then live long enough, you will have done a bunch of things, right? But it's not about like, hey, I'm twenty two. I got to do all of it at once at the same time, at full intensity. That's just, I don't think that works. Um, you're going to get distracted in, in the sense that like, you're not going to be able to actually get good at any of the stuff because you can't get good at 22 things at the same time. You can probably get pretty good at 20 things if you spend two years on it each in a row and then like 40 years later, you're good at 20 things. Absolutely. And I, I really appreciate, and I've listened to a previous interview where you've talked about this, um, you just being really honest about the process that you go on to become really excellent at a particular thing. Because I think when you're describing someone who in their early 20s and they might look at someone like you and be like, oh my goodness, I want to also do all the things. There is a paralysis that can come, right? You get completely overwhelmed and then you almost don't action on anything and it can become an excuse to not action on anything. Yes. It's sort of cyclical. Yes. And and I think it's also one of those things where when you just look at someone else and either you look at accomplishments or, or deep skill or whatever, you rarely know the story that took to get there. And for me, the story was, it was just like one at a time. And then I couldn't have done uh, the things that I have done. Like when I was 22, there was just, there wasn't enough time to do that. Um, so it's funny because I also, in that pendulum, I swing back and forth because I also get annoyed sometimes when people are like, well, to do the very best, like you have to live, breathe, eat and sleep this one thing and only this one thing. And that too was never my thing either, right? Um, in entrepreneurship, this is very often the description of like how someone gets quote unquote success. They're just manically obsessed with just this one thing and they work 120 hours a week and like that's how they get to it. And I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't do that either. I work 40 hours a week. I work 40 hours a week now. I work 40 hours a week then. And the way um, sort of whatever success that came my way was just, again, doing it long enough. Like, if you don't think about that, this whole thing needs to be compressed into, okay, in six months, I'm going to be just super at this, right? Like, hey, let it take a little longer. Hey, it took me, I, I've been driving race cars for like 10 years. I didn't get like really good at it until like five years into it. Um, I've, I've done programming for what, 20 plus years. I, I wasn't that great after two years. It, it takes a while and it's fine. In fact, it's good. I mean, this is the other part of it is that life is long enough if you spend it well. And if I get to the end and like, oh, I spend some of my time on this, some of my time on that, it, it's fine. Like we, life expectancy for someone uh, sort of middle class and above, it's already what, 80 plus years. That's a long time. You don't need to do it all in four years. Right? Like, what are you going to do with the, the rest of, of the 70 years you have left, right? Um, st stretch it out a little bit. It's, it's, um, don't be in such a rush. I think that's the other part of it. Um, and, and like, oh, wow, I got to get to this final destination. When I started, for example, with, with race cars, um, I didn't have aspirations of being like, can I be the best? I just, can I get it better, right? Like, it, let that be the driving motive rather than like, okay, next time I go, like, I just want to get it a little better. Instead of having this end goal, in mind all the time, I can see how maybe that motivates you a little bit, but it can also be discouraging, right? Like, oh, I'm so far away, for example. So I, I started um, to learn how to play guitar when I was, I don't know, 28 or something. And that was one of the examples of, of where I didn't take it all the way through. I, I realized, you know what? I'm not going to put in time. Right. Like, I, I'm not, it takes a fair amount of time if, if you don't have any inclination of musical instruments to learn how to play guitar well enough that you can play a proper song that actually sounds half decent. I just wasn't going to do that. So I gave it up. Right. Like, focus on the things where, hey, it's fine if it's going to take me five years. That's the kind of pursuits I want to be in where I'm okay if this is going to take a long time. Um, and I'm going to enjoy the way there. That's the other part is some people will look and think, oh, I wish I was really good at. X, right? But if you don't really enjoy X and it's just all sort of a grind, 
which is this other word we hear over and over again in entrepreneurship, is this, this grind. You do all these things that you don't like because then you get to sort of some final destination where it's all going to be worth it, right? I, I No, I'm not going to do any of that. I, I don't like the grind at all. I'm not interested in learning anything where the process is a grind because the odds are you're going to get to the end and it's not going to be a success. Most things are not a success most of the time, right? Right. I want to make sure that I enjoy the whole journey there such that if I get there and I've spent five years on it and I, I don't become the best, I don't know, race car driver or photographer or whatever, I'm like, who cares? I got better and I enjoyed it versus it, particularly in entrepreneurship. There are a lot of, of people who start and they start a business and like it's really hard and it's really draining and they're giving up all these other things, especially in technology. They're giving up their fitness. They're giving up their friends. They're giving up all these things just to, to chase the whole wing through. And they spend 10 years on it and it's not a success. And what happens then? They look back and go like, Jesus, I just squandered a decade. That's the kind of stuff that leads to existential dread and regret that on the last day you go, I wish I hadn't spent it like that. Absolutely. You're so good to talk to. I know you can <laughs> you can really talk. It's amazing. Um, are you different in the world than you are online? And if so, how? That's a good question. I think it's the same person, but it's different slices of it and it's different emphasis. I think this mostly comes out with Twitter. I have enough introspection to realize that like my Twitter personality, to put it like that, um, is a narrow one. I mean, the things I choose to tweet about and engage with are usually the things that get me riled up, right? And usually I get riled up. Sometimes I get riled up because I'm really excited about something. 90% of the times I get really riled up because I'm really angry about something. So you get to see this certain sliver of something. But it, I mean, it's still me. I mean, it's not like I have this mask and I'm going to put it on and I'm going to do a performance. Um, I hear that sometimes that there are public personalities who like they go out and they put on a performance and it's kind of like a different character for them. That's not it for me. Like this is who I am and I don't put this on for show. And um, it's just not all of it. Right. Like I don't I don't put everything of who I am into online. Um, there's more. The, the, the part that's out there is, is totally it. But um, let's say the, the Twitter example, like maybe that's 30% of it. Then there's another 70% I just don't put online. I've gotten a little bit better at that, I think, in terms of deciding what I want to put online. Um, earlier, I put more of it in there. And I, I found that I had a late appreciation, I think, perhaps, of both of my personal privacy and my personal sort of revelation to, to, to the world. I, I used to be a more public person in the sense that I would share more of who I was or am more of the time. And I think uh, my wife is, is the exact opposite, right? Very private person. Didn't want to be online um, in, in any sort of exposed sense. And, and in the beginning, I was like, oh, well, why not? Like, what's the... And I, I think I've, I've really learned a lot from that, just the, the joys of keeping things for yourself. And like, you don't have to share everything. And I think that perhaps, I mean, Twitter in particular for me, because that's my main outlet, right? Like there's such a, uh, there's just such a rush. I have 400,000 followers or something. Like almost anything I post, like there's going to be likes, right? And it's just, it's an inherently deeply addictive and oftentimes corrosive model where you go just, you get steered in the direction of where a bunch of strangers want you to go. And I felt that most intensely when I was on Instagram. Which um, I, I was on Instagram when it first got started, and then I quit in 2012 when when sort of they changed the terms of service and so on. And then I got back on in I think 2015 or so. And at first I thought, hey, this is a really nice other dimension. Like Twitter is all angry people yelling at each other, and Instagram is all happy smiling people showing off their belongings and their vacations. Like this seems like a better place to be. Um, <laughs> and for a couple of years, I thought like, hey, it actually is. And like I shared a bunch of things um, from my life and I thought like, wow, we're just looking at beautiful pictures. And I realized I, I liked it far less. A at least the angry people yelling at each other on Twitter, like there's an authenticity to it that I could truly respect. Versus I found myself being in many ways inauthentic on Instagram because it was so much more geared towards what would get a reaction. And I don't want to be steered by what other people want out of me as a reaction. That, that didn't take me to a healthy, happy place. Um, so I ended up quitting um, Instagram and just saying like, yeah, that wasn't for me. And it was such an interesting thing in terms of the joy of missing out because while I was on it, I would post like, I don't know, three or four pictures a week. Um, I was pretty prolific in, in posting on it. And 
I spent a fair amount of time on it and then I quit and it was instant joy. And I never, I, I never looked back and thought like, man, I wish I was back on Instagram. Versus for me, at least on Twitter, that intellectual stimulation when I take a week off, I'm usually sort of like, all right, let's try again, right? Um, I, I never had that with, um, with Instagram and I'm, I'm intensely happy for missing out on both that and on Facebook. So I wrote something down after having read a lot of your your essays and your books and even listening to interviews, you seem to have a really deep commitment to the truth. And I wondered where that comes from. I think that's probably fair. I think it, it's perhaps it's even more of a deep commitment to just the sense of fairness, of justice, and that the truth is a way to get there. And I just, I get so riled up often when I find things that are unfair. There's just, uh, there's all these uh, personality tests you can take where you go in these different bars and like, what do you care about? And whenever I take any of those tests, it's always like I, I score max out on like a sense of justice or unfairness and so on. And the reason I think that happens a lot is just, just how unnecessary so much of it is. I grew up in Copenhagen, Denmark. It, it's a socially democratic state where very low levels of overall inequality compared to other uh, Western societies. Um, and I, I don't think I really appreciated that at the time because, I mean, we were fish and we didn't know what water was. And it wasn't until I came to, to the U.S. where I realized, oh, you could also configure society in a different way. <laughs> that I grew a much deeper appreciation for what I had when I was growing up. And then I started just thinking like, well, why can't more places just do it like that? Like, we're clearly making more people happy more of the time in a, in a society like the Danish. Why, why doesn't this translate? Why doesn't this uh, get further? And I, I think having seen that, having seen that it's possible, having seen that it's possible to A, configure society in a different way, and B, that some societies are configured in such a different way that it's objectively better for more people more of the time, Shouldn't we all be on a path to get to that place? Um, I think that's that's just been kind of, yeah, thrust upon me with that. And it, it goes beyond even just societal critiques. It goes on within, um, within the company, too. So I worked at a bunch of tech companies in the early 2000s um, before kind of becoming an executive as, at, at Basecamp. And the things that are burned in on my retina of having seen is unfairness. Like decisions that led to unfairness where I just went like, that's not fair. That's not right. And then having that sense, those scars, essentially, that like, hey, if I get a chance to run things, if I get a chance to decide things, we're going to make them fair. And we're going to make them transparent and obvious to a point where um, people may disagree, but they're not going to go like, hey, you withheld something and you did it for sort of some sort of sly gain. One of the specific examples of this was at Basecamp, we used to set pay as any other company would do. You'd kind of do a negotiation and maybe you'd, I don't know, ask what someone made before. And I was always very deeply uncomfortable that I don't like negotiating. I don't like haggling. Um, and that's essentially a haggle, right? With, with an employee and you start out on, on that, that you're trying to, to get something cheaper, all right? Like that's what haggle is. Um, I didn't like that at all. And, and I didn't like this idea that we could have two people at Basecamp who would then discuss their salary and one person would go like, wait, what? You make what? How did you do that? And, and they'd go like, well, I guess I asked for it or like I came at the right time or whatever. And I just said, you know what? I want every person at Basecamp that if um, the sort of payroll was public, they'd go like, well, maybe I want to make more money. But like I can understand how all the things are the way they are. Right. Um, so we ended up doing that with a very sort of programmatic approach where in technology, there's these survey companies that, that can tell you, like, what is the top 10 percentile of companies? How much do they pay as a senior programmer that works in San Francisco, for example? And a lot of times companies use these as sort of guidances to help them. Like, are we roughly within the... We didn't do that. We just made it the rule. If you are a senior programmer at Basecamp, you will make, I think we just publicized this in, a, in an opening, because that was the other thing about the transparency. We went all the way through even to the public. Like, you're going to make $146,390. That's it. There's no negotiation. Like, if, if you're sort of assessed to be a senior programmer, whether you're in San Francisco or in Idaho or in Madrid, you're going to make $146,390. Um, and would you give up in your ability to perhaps sort of negotiate that better 
you gain in the knowledge that like every other senior programmer at Basecamp, they're making that. It's a fair number that's derived from an objective sense of, at Basecamp, we say we want to pay in the top 10 percentile of, um, of salaries for San Francisco. That that's, that's just it. And then it's, it's a table. You look up in a table what the salary is, and, and that's that. And that, to me, gave me this confidence that, like, again, there may be built-in inequities in that table. You could go, like, there's still a capitalist setup, and, like, we're rewarding people out of scarcity, not necessarily out of value, or all these other critiques you can make of the framework. But the framework itself has some objective fairness to it. And that was just one of the things that I was just so thrilled to get off my plate as a manager, as a, as a company owner, that we weren't going to have these uncomfortable end of year hackles anymore. Yeah. Um, where I was trying to sort of hold something back and, and trying to get as much as I could for as little as possible. That just always struck me as a profoundly uncomfortable situation to be in when you're dealing with other human beings. Absolutely. I'm mindful of our time and I'm going to start to wind this down. Um, you offer a lot of advice in a lot of different places, books and essays and podcasts. Um, my favorite piece comes from your essay, Let's Bury the Hustle, where you say, quote, say no to more dumb shit. Engage with fewer things, but at a higher intensity. Stick with it. Stop chasing so much. And for God's sake, relax, pumping your mind full of anxiety about whether you're getting enough, doing enough, chasing enough is no way to live. Background stress like that is literally lethal. Put in a good day's work, then close the damn laptop. Waste some time on the rest of the human experience. Dare to be so bold as to embrace the ordinary every now and then. And my question for you is what do you hope we stop chasing? after COVID-19 has run its course? Wow, yeah, that's a, that's a big question because I think a lot of the chase, well, there are some commonalities and a lot of people have a general chase of sort of quote-unquote success um, in, in business. I just had another interview uh, two days ago um, with, with a guy who works in, in venture capital and we were talking about like, what is, what is the purpose? What is the meaning? What are, we, what are we running after? And what happens when we get there? And what I was trying to impart was um, I got there. I got to the place a lot of people are trying to run to in terms of company success, in terms of money. And I, I wrote a bunch of this up in, um, uh, in an essay called um, The Day I Became a Millionaire. Because I think that that is probably the most concrete chase that a lot of people have, um, at least in, in technology and entrepreneurship circles, which is where I spend my time is, they're trying to get to this place where you know, they're success, they're, they're rich. And, and they're imagining what life would be like when they get there. And I had some of those same imaginations of what life would be like. And then I, it happened. And I was, I was surprised. And the more people I talked to who also happened to get there, uh, the more I realized that that surprise was pretty widely distributed. This idea that life was going to be so much different if if you got to these certain goals, that like your inner world would totally change and your your moods or your emotions would be regulated in a different way. They, they were just, there was such false hope. So what I'm trying to do, if anything, is to disabuse people that like, it's going to be that different. Now, that should always be said with like a thousand caveats of privilege and so on, that this is mostly talking to people who are, who are not like in an existential fight for shelter, food, Whatever. It is for people who are already at a um, comfortable place of living, whatever, however you define that. Um, but I mean, I define my comfortable place of living in, to include my experience growing up uh, a sort of working class in Denmark, right? Um, so I think it's a pretty broad concept, but um, this idea that is, life is going to get so much different, I'm going to be so much happier when I get there. I've just seen constant refutation of that and and this is one of those things where once you realize that that's that the chase isn't worth it for its end goal you can start realizing well it's still fun to strive it's still fun to learn it's still fun to climb it's still fun to create how can i create the sort of the boundaries so that my focus is on that that was one of the reasons why i'm so big on the 40-hour work week is that it's not because I don't like work. 
some people have this idea in their head that like, oh, if you really love what you do, no amount of time is too much time. And if you really love what you do, you should work 80 hours, 100 hours, 120 hours a week. And I go like, no, because I, I also really love chocolate covered strawberries, right? I don't want to eat 2000 of them. Like they're great when I have like five, maybe that's even three too many. But <laughs> this idea that you can savor something, that it's really good, and it doesn't have to be the be all of your entire existence, right? Not just because it's not about sort of reaching that final destination, you get to be the success, and you get to make, like, make a lot of money, but also just because that chase in itself is not that, um, um, it's not as good if it's all you do. That perspective you get from having just a few things that you focus on with all your heart for a limited amount of time. That is the best definition of personal happiness that I've found. That I can pick, hey, here are four things. Not one thing. I don't think that's healthy. Here's four things. I'm going to lean my ego and my existence on all four. And if one of them falls away, I won't be destroyed. I won't be uh, sort of completely despairing because, say, my business went out of business, which is one of those things that can very often happen when, when you put in 120 uh, hours into just the one thing. There's nothing left if that, if that thing fails, which it most often does because most things in business do fail, right? So there are these four things, but they also can't be 20, as we talked about, right? I can't have 20 things on my plate. Then I can't do any of it sort of justice. So having a few things, doing them well, and just designing your life in such a way that you can just enjoy the day, right? You, I, I enjoy this day. And my best days at work are the ones where it's about five o'clock and I look back upon the stuff that I got done and I'm like, here are three important things I got done. They're great. I, I really made a breakthrough on this. I maybe got half started on this. I'm halfway up the hill on this one project and, and I'm still excited about it, but I'm going to close it and I'm going to be excited about opening it up again tomorrow. That to me has really been the notion of calm, that like, it's enough, I'm focusing on today, and we're going to shut the laptop when, when that day's up. I'm curious, just to include in the show notes, are there some books or programs or thinkers right now influencing your thinking that you would want? Yes, yes. I, I always I always like to plug that. Um, if I was to say one person who I've read the most from over the past two years, it's Eric Frum. He's a psychoanalyst uh, from, from the 20th century who written a bunch of incredibly impactful books for me. I'd recommend two in particular. One is called To Have or to be, which speaks directly to all the stuff we just talked about in the end, um, about sort of the difference between defining who you are versus what you have and kind of the critique of capitalist modern society that inherent in that. And then um, Escape from Freedom, which is a, another one of his books that uh, gave me such clarity on what's going on in the political world since 2016 and why people make the choices that they do. and. And it's not because everyone just turned stupid all of a sudden. There are larger factors at play. And, and he wrote this book in, in the 30s with, with all sorts of other um, factors at play. And I thought it was just remarkable how sort of timely it was, even if it was like 80 years off. Um, I always like to plug the Stoics. Um, one book in particular I plug is called The Manual by Epictetus. And the reason I plug that is you can read it in 45 minutes. It is the most distilled book of kind of everyday wisdom, I think, that's ever been compiled. How succinct it is and how broadly it covers the entire human condition is incredible. In just in, uh, I try to read it a, at least a couple of times a year. I've given it out many times. It's a very short book that is basically sort of like all the highlights of Stoic philosophy. And then hopefully someone would go like, wow, that's really interesting. And then you can always dive into to Seneca or Marcus Aurelius after that. But Epictetus, the manual, is just such a power punch. Um, yeah, let's start with, with those two. And then, I mean, I will obviously link to where everyone can find you. That's not hard to do your personal website and the Basecamp website, Twitter, anything else? Uh, feel free to link to our new product, hey.com. It's not out yet, but people can send us a so uh, funny thing of increasing friction as a, as a way of, of having benefit is, is to sign up to be kind of invited to, to use Hey, you have to send us a story 
about what email means to you. Like, there's not just like a form you can put in your email address. You got to send us a story to I want at hey.com about email, which 40,000 people have done so far. Some people have sent a poem. Some people have sent a long story, a narrative about it. Some people just send a paragraph. Some people have sent a quote. Um, there's been all sorts of really interesting uh, meditations on what email is and what it means to people from this and which is of course perfect we're building a new email service that wants oh, yeah. to 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 do this to do this differently so yeah that that that's um i'd be remiss if i didn't pluck that of course where it's going to come probably be out sometime this summer when we feel like both employees and the world are ready to launch a product amazing thank you so much i was just i when i heard that you had said yes to this interview is beyond thrilled yeah no thank you so much for having me on for this Jomo as a whole concept was one of those things that just like, you're just so happy to find a articulation of what you felt for a long time. It's just funny because when we get feedback from the books we, we've we written, the most loving feedback we get is when people feel like the things they couldn't say were said. That there's there's sort of an echo of like, I was already feeling that, but I thought no one else did. Um I think Jomo has that quality to me of of labeling something that a lot of people did feel that they did feel better when they were missing out. And now there's a concept you can use it to actually communicate that to other people. Um, it was the same thing I got out of the Stoics, that a lot of the Stoic tactics for, for living were things I had like a bad beta version of running on my own personal software. And then someone else kind of articulated it and and I could just upgrade and I could find recognition in that and just go like, you know what? We're not that special. Much of our inner life is also the inner life of others. And the more we can articulate that, the less bad we can feel about ourselves, the less anxiety we can feel about itself. And the more we can find sort of shared communion in trying to live with that condition that is sort of human life. I love it. David, thank you so much for being with me. Yeah, this is good. This is great. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about our guests in the show notes and by visiting jomocast.com. The Jomocast is edited and music composed by Thomas J. Inge. Visit Tom online at tinge, that's T-I-N-D-G-E dot com to learn more about Tom and his services. The Jomocast is listener supported. Sign up as a patron at patreon.com forward slash jomocast. Patreon support makes the podcast possible. For just $3 a month, you will keep these conversations going. That link again is patreon.com forward slash JomoCast. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast with your provider of choice. And if you loved this episode, leave us a five-star review. These reviews are a powerful way you can help us reach more listeners. I'm your host, Christina Crook. Thanks for listening. And may you find joy missing out on the right things.